Hello lovely Instagrammers. I am going live with Stacey Duguid, who has been incredibly brave talking about and I have never met Stacey. Uh, and there she is. Hi there. <laughs> Hi there. How are you? Very well. That's so lovely to meet you. I must say I feel I know you because I've been reading your wonderful articles and your page and I really um, take my hat off to you to, to, to the honesty of your experience of I'm just going to move myself a bit because I'm not high enough up um, of separating divorce moving working and you've really kind of laid yourself open and do, to those of my followers who don't know you, do you want to say, kind of, can you tell us what you've been through and, yeah, yeah tell us what you've been through and where you're at now? Um, hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm, first of all, I'm so happy to be on with you. Gosh, what an honour it is. You're amazing. Anyway. Oh, um, uh, huh? absolutely the same i feel the same about you so it's i'm it's a it's a it's a win-win <laughs> so i um i met my ex soon to be ex-husband in my mid-30s i was very much in love had two children back to back in my late 30s 23 months apart bless them um, the kind of living the dream type thing yeah living the dream you know the thing with my generation i'm 48 we were the kind of i would sort of describe us as like the post-feminist fallout we were kind of still you can have it all generation you know that mantra as you know a wheeled career, out by yeah you can be yeah, a mother you can, you can be a wife you can work you can do everything and we know that's not true really it really is I not mean, true no yes and actually, when you get to 35 and you look around, you're like, oh gosh, okay, so I didn't actually get the memo <laughs> that in order to have children, I have to meet someone because I was too busy with the career. But anyway, long story short, I met the man of my dreams. And I say that genuinely. And he, you know, was so different from all the other guys I've been dating. But as with all relationships, you know, 10 years together, and it just, in the end, wasn't working. And the tragedy for me, when I sit back and I look at, at the last two years, I left the family home because one of us had to leave and we both decided that it would be me um, for various reasons. Um, but when I look back at that time, I had no idea what I was getting into. I've dismantled my family life in pursuit of my own happiness, to quote Adele. <laughs> um, yeah. But for what? I find myself in this strange hinterland this kind of unknown territory limbo. I'm trying to I'm in limbo and I'm trying to navigate and actually a follower messaged me today it was such a beautifully written uh, direct message to me today she wrote it's almost as though divorce is like empty nest syndrome but 10 years too soon you oh God, that's so you know, clever you've, been, you've left the, the 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 safety of your kitchen and your home when you're really not ready. No one's no. ready. You haven't, done, no. you haven't done the proper time. No. And especially not when your youngest is eight, about to turn nine, and all you want to do is be with that little girl, and it's heartbreaking. But... It, I mean, in my, it, so in my terms, and I think it's not recognised nearly enough, you're really grieving, you know, it's a, and what I would call it is a living loss. And it has all... Yeah emotions and the experience of grief where you feel yeah. like you've been thrown onto this alien planet you don't feel, have a map i don't have a map and um, but i do feel really guilty about describing it as deep mourning and loss and grief especially when i know the kind of people that you help who have lost children you know and i i just feel that that's sort of a step too far for me to say but i'm mourning this loss but actually it is a grief and it's a roller coaster and it, it comes at you when you're least expecting it. Like this week has been horrible. I've moved, <laughs> I've moved for the third time in two years to another rental. I feel so uprooted and disconnected and I, I am 
almost sort of disassociating from the stress. I've unpacked like a friend in a frenzy and then I cried myself to sleep on Sunday night. Mm. Just from, like the whole like, oh. And I'm trying to buy a house, but you know, the court orders in and the divorce money's coming and this, that and the other. And you find yourself as a freelance journalist unable really to get much of a mortgage. You know, and you find, you think, Terrifying. Oh God, I didn't think this through. Can I go back to the grief thing? So one of the things I really think um, is, is important to recognize is that there isn't a hierarchy. You know, we each have our own subjective experiences of loss and they each have their own particular pain and particular unique aspects. And I think to compare one to another is unhelpful for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I think legitimizing what you're feeling rather than delegitimizing it, saying, you know, this isn't as bad as a child dying. That doesn't help someone whose child has died and it doesn't help you. Yeah, that's true. Think letting yourself know that this is a time of real suffering for you. And, mm. you know, as you said, you, you, you look back at yourself two and a half years ago and you did not have a clue what you were letting yourself in for. Absolutely not. And actually last week's column was about that in the Telegraph, I have a weekly column. And yeah. I wrote essentially- very good column. Why way. did I leave? You know. So why did you leave? What do you understand now? Uh, it's a really good question. And it's one I ask myself more than once a day. I left because in my mind, there was something bigger. And I don't, I can't articulate it because it's not another person. Um, it was an unhappiness within myself. It just wasn't enough it was lovely but it wasn't enough it wasn't you wanted bigger wanted. experiences you wanted bigger deeper intensity you wanted yeah the intensity the intimacy and all of that stuff that comes with you know what you have to work at in a relationship um you can be very good friends with somebody and not have that side of your relationship or you can be vice versa you can be very intimate with someone and not like them you know there's all yeah. sorts of you know, different types of relationships. But I think when you're with a life partner, you have to weigh up, okay, is this what I want when I'm 70? And I suppose the way I looked at my life and thought, gosh, on paper, here we have arrived. The house, the kids, living in a nice part of Northwest London. The kids are at the local gorgeous state school. They've got loads of mates. But I wasn't happy. And it sounds like you were bored. <laughs> I was bored. I wasn't happy. I was living a life that wasn't meant for me. And it sounds ridiculous. Did it because feel I like can't... you were a kind of performer in your life? You weren't in, in it, in it. Do you know if I'm, <sighs> this sounds terrible, but I felt like I was tr striving for the life that my mother never had. Oh, wow. So my mother, that, that my grandmother, helpful. Had, my mother, my grandmother, and my great grandmother all worked in the same cigarette factory in working class Manchester. My great grandmother was uh, working the mills from the age of eight, was cleaning oh, yeah. the uh, council toilets, taking her own granddaughter to work with her. Tough lads, um, working class, working Different working. lives. Proper Tough working lives. class. Pro yeah. And my mum remarried when I was six. And so I had a, from the age of six onwards, had a very different experience to that, which, you know, allowed me actually to, I was brought up in Edinburgh, I moved from Manchester to Edinburgh. I went to a really nice school where I met brilliant teachers who opened my eyes up to the world. And I left Edinburgh, 18, and I, I didn't go to university and I just started to work. And I worked and worked and worked and I have this ethic, you know, you talk about transgenerational trauma, do you? Patterns and trauma, yeah. Patterns, yes. And um, trauma, yeah, yeah. But um, actually, if I'm not working hard to the point of exhaustion, then I don't know who I am. And I've had to sort of really step back off that sort of wheel as well. And it was all sort of tangled up in this sort of perfect life and I got the perfect life on paper and I didn't want it. It sounds bizarre. I know it does. 
But I, let me tell you what I understand is that you, it sounds like you were living the life of the fight to do more than to survive, to have security, financial security, to mm. matter to people, to give your children financial security. But it didn't come from an internal place of authenticity. It came from a place of inherited fear. Ooh. So it came from somewhere that's outside of you, kind of pushing your buttons, if you like, rather than this is my choice from my dream for myself. Yeah. And it's so interesting that you have now in some ways find yourself in the place <laughs> that most threatens that safety. It's bizarre. You know, talk as my mum was a single mum from when I was three years old. And she worked nights on a till in a supermarket. And she actually ended up marrying the shop manager <laughs> who Did became she? my stepfather. Yeah. And, and he's gave Scottish, she's from life. Aberdeen. So that's, yeah, yeah, much better life. Um, by the way, I'd just like to say that, uh, I don't know, can you, can you see me? Um, you know, yeah. when we're talking about working class, historically, we're talking about, you know, my grandparents were very proud. The house was always yeah. immaculate, you know, they always yeah. worked. It was like, um, and like, you know, it's just this, I've inherited my grandmother's, like she was dressed in Marks and Spencers, but she was always done. Immaculate. As a classic Northern woman, immaculate Northern Hair, woman. Immaculate makeup. Yeah. And I'm from a long line of immaculate Northern women. I do, you know, I just think that's very important to, to and, add. And into you're an story. immaculate Northern woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, working class does not mean without a star or, you know, uh, uh, beauty, it, it, it represents the work that they did, doesn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, and actually, so in this, you know, the grief, I left the marriage unplanned, um, rather chaotically. I might, I'm not sure if you know, but I was diagnosed ADHD last April, oh, which wow. sort of, that would have Make contributed to you leaving, yeah. Yes. Um, and it, you know, and I think that kind of lack of planning and I never had any sort of financial planning. I was just like, I, I'm done here. I don't know how to move on. I need to make my children okay, um, make sure they're okay. I had been in very, very good therapy for three years prior. I'm still in with the same therapist since four years now. It's brilliant. Um, but I knew I wanted a different life for myself and for them. But I sort of threw myself out there thinking it'll all be fine because at the time I had a well-paid job, full time. I could more than afford to support myself. Um, but, you know, I just, pandemic, Alice Lyle says, hey, Stacey and Julia, immaculate Northern women. I give you immaculate Northern women. Absolutely. <laughs> so you, you, the picture you had was I'm going to be fine. I've got a, I've got a secure job. You know, I've done this for 20 years. I've, I've built my career. So your decision influenced by your ADHD. So it was a kind of erratic decision, but also yeah, was impulsive. informed, but impulsive. It was informed by your experience, which is that you can make things happen and you can support yourself. 100%, I always have. And I also watched my mother be a single parent. So I was like, this is, I can do this. And then of course, you know, times have really changed post pandemic. The industry that I work in where, you know, historically, well, first of all, um, my job finished. I Ugh. couldn't cope with, I couldn't yeah. cope with getting divorced, being a single parent and working those hours. It, and it was a very, very stressful job. So that ended, but actually, you know, as one thing ends, another thing begins, another the Telegraph column, and going back to journalism. It's a great column. Thank you. Thank you. Um, going back to journalism has allowed me the freedom to be truly with the children. And I have thrown myself into manic because I have 50 50 custody. And so the three days in the week that I'm with them, I'm with them. I pick them up from school. I'm with them every day after school. And I really put the hours in with them. And actually, two years on, we've all really turned a corner. But I still. 
I'm still in limbo because I, we, you know, the finances have all been sorted out, but it's yet to, you know, materialize. So there's been a lot to sort out. I think I didn't anticipate this because nobody's really ever talked about it before. Yeah. You know, it's this kind of hidden thing that, especially women, it's, a, it's an embarrassment. You don't talk about getting divorced or the pain or the shame around the grief you feel about, especially if you're the one that's been done the dismantling yourself. You know, you often hear of women who- Women that are left. left. Yeah, but not the other way around or not even that, just the sort of the nitty gritty of the process of divorce and what you have to go through and the emotion of it. And that's why I spoke out. I made the decision two years ago to either start speaking truthfully about it or to come off social media altogether because the hashtag handbag lifestyle is just not who I am. I have to speak my truth. And if I can't speak my truth, I'd rather not be on social media. So uh, the Let first me just post. add that Alex33 says, I see you. And Jodie says, thank you for being real. And Camilla Zieri sends you a big heart. So, I mean, I think, <laughs> and Chrissy is saying it took me years to recover and that being strong as Northern women isn't always in their best interest. <laughs> um, and so I think you'll do, I mean, it, it obviously, it's a, uh, and Linda saying it's often harder on women. I think there's more shame on women, isn't there? Mm -hmm. I think there's more a sense of shame that somehow we failed or that we, we got this yeah. wrong. But I wonder if that's some sort of like internalized misogyny where- I think it is. We truly believe as women that we have to, you know, it's the classic, isn't it? Like, you know, we're constantly micromanaging every aspect of family life. And actually we do it because we think it's our job to do it. In the same way that we believe fully that it's our job to be homemakers, not home wreckers. It's our job to make sure we put our children first. And actually when you step out of that for a moment and look in and think, okay, this feels against my very nature, but I'm still gonna do it anyway. That's the bit that really interests me most. And actually in a way, feeling this sort of unsettled and destabilized for the last two years feels like a punishment. And I sort of sometimes think of it as like, I deserve this, I had this coming. I oh deserve God. it, but then I have to talk myself round. Because no man would think like that. No man would I ever think, think so. like that. But we do believe that we have to be the kind of the linchpin of it all. And the fixer, the making everything right and making everything work. And mm -hmm. you're getting a lot of support. Self-care is not selfish. You have to put yourself first. But I think the, um, and Alex says she's got a lot of shame around her divorce. Yeah. I think I think one of the things I'm wondering around uh, about with you is that you know there is this idea which I'm sure your therapist talks to you about is that the destabilizing you know the breakdown to some extent is a breakthrough that pain is the agent of change that if you hadn't done this in some ways you would have been more and more brittle living this life that wasn't really yours that wasn't yeah. internally congruently yours mm -hmm. and so while it feels extremely frightening and and brings up a whole raft of incredibly uncomfortable feelings of shame of fear of being judged of not knowing the future all of all of that um there is something about pain being the agent of change that through it it and it sounds like you know in some of your columns it does really feel like you're learning things about yourself and for yourself that will will build you. But it's not a kind of, you know, upward trajectory. It's a, it's a roller coaster. Yeah. But that you are rebuilding yourself as the woman that you need to be um, rather than performing and living somebody else's life. That's right. And um, that's really well put. And actually, I have... I was supposed to, to go to art school, but I didn't, uh, long story. Um, um, but so now I'm, I'm working with um, someone I used to do a, a night class with called Tony Hull. And he's an art, he's an artist, but he's an art teacher at City Lit. And if anyone ever, if anyone lives in London gets an opportunity to go to City Lit, please go. <laughs> like they are the most, it's sort of, this, it, it presents as this really kind of old fashioned, funny 
course, you know, courses for adults, but it's actually really radical. Like, you know, where else could you meet someone? I was talking to someone yesterday about um, this girl who was taking the course, woman who was taking the course was deaf, but she's sign language, she's sign language, but only in Arabic. And sign language in English is her second sign language. <laughs> it's just, wow. And that's you know, amazing. You meet everyone on these courses, like at City Lit, you know, the um Very inspiring. You know, the blind the deaf you know everybody it's extraordinary anyway so tony hell was my teacher and i bumped into him last summer and he said what's happening with your art practice and i said it's not and um and now we meet once a week on facetime and i'm working with him on building a portfolio getting ready to apply for my masters straight to masters um in fine art good for you that's yeah. amazing so rather than saying that you're in limbo, I would reframe it as you're in a fertile void. So oh. that you're, it's a gestalt term. Um, right. And so it's this place of not knowing and that you test things out, you experiment, you feel kind of uncertain, mm -hmm. but it's a fertile void. Oh, I so, love that. <laughs> yes. So it's not an empty space that takes you down to Hades hell. It's uh -huh. a creative space that you find your creativity and who you are through yourself by these different experiments, by trying stuff out. Some will work, some won't work. When they don't work, it feels like shit. But when they it feels like you're finding yourself and that that, that, that kind of thrill of energy, you know, yeah. as you talked about him, I could see the volume on you turned up, you know, because this is, yeah, you know, he's amazing. It, it lets you know who you are and what you need to be doing. And you've got Absolutely. to also then bring home the bacon and do stuff that you don't want to do because we all do. I mean, that is yeah. also true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, at least I know what my sort of midlife crisis tattoo is going to be. What is it? <laughs> fertile void. Yes, fertile void, of course. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being so slow. I was reading someone else's. No, don't do that because it would really put somebody off, by the way. But um, <laughs> I'm joking. If, well, maybe not. Um, right. So, but that's Linda's a really, saying really we good way of putting it. Linda Moore Graham is saying we model living for our children whatever we want for our children we must model and I think that's true is that our children yeah. learn from what that's we do really true, not from yeah. what we say and so absolutely you know they see you fall they see you get up they see you cry they see that you get the cottage pie they see you you know and that models to them they can also you know make mistakes and 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 still survive I had a, a cry, I had a cry this afternoon, very brief cry. I don't often cry anymore. I, um, I, I went on a course of antidepressants three months ago, just because I was crying daily. Um, and my, I mean, I, my GP was like, this will just provide you with a cushion for a year. So anyway, but today I had a small cry and I, I had spoken to my therapist about how do you deal with that in front of your children? And she said, you talk to them about it. And I feel sad today. I feel sad. And, he, and my son said, what's the matter? And I said, I, we've moved for the third time and I feel so sorry for you that we've had to do that. And my friends have given it, us their house for free for the summer. Amazing. They're selling it and I'm helping them sell it by putting my nice things in it. Blah, blah. But, you know, although we've had lots of fun times in this house over many, many years. They never live in Sydney. You know, it still feels like yet yeah, another temporary home, not even just a temporary home, a temporary home that people are going to be in and out of looking at to buy. And it just overwhelms me today Yeah. as I was mopping the floor for the 50th time <laughs> so that the place looked immaculate, you know. It's a sort of metaphor for not having your ba own base, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. I think we underestimate the importance of place and home that in order to feel connected to ourselves and connected to others, we need to feel safe Absolutely. and we need to feel safe in a, around our own kitchen table, you know, That's somewhere right. that where we belong, that you walk through that door and you're safe. It doesn't, yeah. you know, it can, 
and yours is you've been in a state of total change and transition for two years yeah it's that too is long. really disturbing yeah yeah it's way too long um but i promised myself that the next move because things will have to sort out i mean there's now a court order the money i will have to have enough money to be able to put a deposit down get a mortgage da -da -da, and buy a home and i don't mind if that's a small flat or whatever it is i just it's good it you know it has to be the next move I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing this another two times. And I actually, then I don't want to move for 10 years. I'm done. Yeah. You know, yeah. The children are, will be finished school in 10 years. So, um, and you want but, that stability. You know what I did yesterday, which actually felt very empowering. And it's something that I haven't done before is I went to see, um, a very sensible financial advisor at a firm in town. It's actually a mortgage meeting, but, um, and then he's, he's not on commission. So I sort of, you know, he, and he's very sensible, very kind of prudent and sensible. It's like, is, is this what you can afford? And we did all the outgoings, which is like a real eye opener. Um, and then, you know, then the, he introduced me to this fabulous woman called Louise, who's a financial planner and she really got it. She was like, she said, you're on a different road now. And I said, yeah, I really am. And, I think the fear that you spoke of earlier about not knowing the unknown. where to be, like in my mind, I just keep getting that scene from Bridget Jones where she's being eaten by Alsatians, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's me in a bed set somewhere. And I'm like, you know, well, yeah, that's actually does happen to people. But if you sort of, I mean, that's so frightening. You think you're only right. just a breath away from that, but I work and I have to work harder and just just get through it. And I know that I'm not going to end up. I see you up. taking your breath. <sighs> I'm on my bed right now. <laughs> Good. Well, lie down. But I, I mean, what I was aware of as you were talking is not knowing is so much more frightening than than almost anything because your imagination is completely limitless. Yeah. You can terrify yourself with this sort of absolute shithole that you you know, and the attack by Alsatians that you're going to live in. And that can, that becomes the story you tell yourself. And then that kind of informs you on a daily basis. And then you kind of feel really, you know, um, threatened by an image that you've made up for yourself. Exactly. <laughs> so, so if I can reframe Fertile Void... Yes. You know, that this is a fertile period of discovery. I love the word fertile generally, but, yeah. you know, rich period of discovery that I may never have again. So exactly. it's, it's an opportunity. Yeah. But also talking to those very sound financial advisors who really got it, that's mm. very grounding mm. because it gives you information. It gives you numbers, numbers on a page. It mm. gives you what you're likely to be able to spend. It gives you... Mm. So having information really helps against the fear. Yeah, exactly. They also really understood what I do for a living. And that is, you know, at 80, I will still be writing. They were talking about mortgages at, at the age of 80. You know, it's just an interesting time. We had this, you know, inherited idea that at 65, we all just stop working. It's just not, it's just not how it's going to be for so many of us. Most of us. That, I mean, the hundred year life for one thing. You know, yeah. we've got to pay for ourselves because, I mean, in some ways with good luck, if we have good health, we'll be working till we die, probably. Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, the the grief, the feelings of grief, it's a shocker because the grief comes in so hard Does. and then it disappears. And that's just... It comes shocking. like a wave. Yeah, yeah. Whereas at and the, the beginning... Can, can I... Um, I mean, I'm sure I know your therapist is really good, but remember that there's two movements in grief. There's loss orientation, which is when the wave comes and gets you and knocks you over or fills you with fear or fills you with rage or regret or the what ifs or why did I, all of that. But the other side of it is, is restorative, is the impetus to survive, to get on, to be okay, to live again, <laughs> to love again. And in the process of grieving, we move between the two. 
Okay. So when you let yourself cry, like you did yesterday, when you let the, the wave come through you, the emotions are transmitters of information. So it's saying, ow, this is ending. Fuck, I'm scared. All right. of that. But it forces you to adapt to this new reality. So it's okay. information that you need to learn to face this new reality. I am now single. I'm a single mom. I don't have the financial status or position I did have. But as you do that, it also frees you to oscillate to the other side where you have plans, where you see your art teacher, where you have hope, where you see your financial advisor, where you kind of rebuild your life. And it's the movement, the oscillation between the two. And if you support yourself to do the loss work, you will naturally do the restorative healing work. And it's when you block the loss that you also block the healing. Does that make sense? It does, it makes total sense. That's really helpful. You also good. know that when that wave hits, it is going to end. It doesn't keep on hitting. Oh, it did for the first three months. The first three months was Must have been like awful. It was just here. I, I mean, I didn't eat or sleep for three months. I'm so um, sorry. And yeah. so many people here are listening. Carolina and Steph and Chrissy. They're all. I think they really recognise their experience and your experience. So I think you're really speaking for them. And that's yeah, a, a wonderful right. thing that you can do that. And Gifo saying, follow your heart and dreams, onwards and upwards. And actually, you know, what's interesting as well, because I had, um, I get lots of male comments on the column for the Telegraph and apparently oh, they're you? horrible. Apparently they're horrible, I don't read them. But oh, one, so kind of pervy ones. Yeah, no mean, super mean, very, very <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, but anyone, you know, people do that. Uh, but somebody sent, uh, a man sent a message to me asking why I wrote the column, but he messaged me on LinkedIn and I said to him, to surely give middle-aged women a voice beyond the kind of traditional trajectory of two kids and happily married, you know, ever after, like, you know, we're supposed to sort of sink into the background. And I think sometimes when I think about those comments beneath my column, it's because actually we're voicing our... I don't think, but yeah. we're voice, but we know this is the first time in a long time that women have been outspoken about divorce, about so many things, finances, you know, debt, grief, whatever it is. And yes. I think it's really, really important. And toxic masculinity. I love your columns about dating. I mean, I wouldn't like to be doing that dating, I have to say, but they are very funny. They are very <laughs> funny. Well, so, you so know. So so Stacy is, uh, Shenny says, Stacy is basically a glamorous version of me. This is the therapy I needed. Well, I'm glad you got it, Shenny. She is an amazing woman. Um, you are amazing. I hope we talk again. I hope we do too. I really enjoyed it. I particularly enjoyed shouting out my bedroom door because, of course, we've only been here for five days and I've got this dongle beside me. Get off the Wi Fi! <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> do not come in the door it's the school holidays yeah so but anyway it was an absolute pleasure to meet you and um how is the book going going really well thanks um i i'm in hay now i'm in wales i'm going to the festival tomorrow and i was in amsterdam this morning i, I did a, an event for the dutch edition and my an easy jet of wow. course cancelled the plane yeah of course yeah. of course i queued I, you know, all that fucking stuff of traveling. Yeah, I know, it was mad, wasn't it? Um, but your little videos that you do, your kind of Monday morning, whatever it I is. Do you like those? Do you know what? I have to say, sometimes when I'm, it's totally spinning out, it's just, you have the most <laughs> gorgeous voice. Thank and you. it's really calming. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for Well, much. I'll keep doing them. And, um, and you keep, you're doing, I think you're probably doing a much, much better than you realize you are. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because in the oscillation, when you're in the, in the lost thing where you are now, because you've just moved in, you kind of fit. Do you remember, do you know that kind of thing that when it's raining, you think it's always raining, mm -hmm. but then the sun comes out. It's that thing that when you're in it, you never believe you're going to have any other feeling. Yeah. But so by true. allowing yourself to feel it, 
you will have the other feeling. So you're doing really, really well. Thank you. And if I can help you, let me know. Very happy Thank to. You. Nice to meet you and nice all of your lovely you. Thank followers. Thank you for joining. Bye. And thank you, everyone, for all your lovely encouragement and engagement and enjoy, in, enjoyment. Enjoying Stacey. She is amazing. And um, all of you have a good evening. Lots of love. <laughs> Bye. Bye.